Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is Kate Myers with the California Healthcare Foundation, and I'm happy to have you all on the line today. This webinar is part of the California Healthcare Foundation's SB 1004 Technical Assistance Series, which aims to help Medicare managed care organizations, medical groups uh, that carry delegated risk from Medi-Cal plans, and palliative care providers to prepare for implementation of SB 1004 in January. This technical assistance series is being co-led by Dr. Ann Kinderman of Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital and Kathleen Kerr of Kerr Healthcare Analytics. And this is our third topic in the series, Assessing Palliative Care Capacity and Launching Palliative Care Services. The presentation on today's webinar will be led by Dr. Kinderman, who's an Associate Clinical Professor of Medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and is the Founding Director of the Supportive and Palliative Care Service at San Francisco General Hospital. Information on the first two topics that have already taken place in this technical assistance series, uh, which were on the topics of estimating volume and baseline costs, and estimating care delivery costs uh, are available on our website at chcf.org slash SB1004. And that link is also in the slides, um, so you'll see that again. The webinar slides and the recording of the webinar will be distributed hopefully later this week. Um, and as you probably know, the lines for participants are muted because we have a lot of participants and want to keep background noise to a minimum. Um, but we should have a few minutes for questions at the end, so please feel free to type those questions into the chat box as they arise. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Anne. Great. Thanks so much, Kate. Um, so I'm very pleased to be talking with all of you uh, today about uh, assessing palliative care capacity, and then launching your palliative care services, if you have not already. So um, first what I wanted to do is um, uh, provide some updates or um, share with you kind of what I know, um, which is uh, hopefully the same thing that uh, the managed care plans and others on the phone um, have learned about SB 1004 just in the last uh, couple of months. Um, so in October, uh, the Department of Healthcare Services uh, released the final version of the all plan letter um, and distributed that to all of the Medi-Cal plans, um, which uh, clarifies all of the um, requirements and the eligibility criteria for uh, SB 1004. In uh, November, the plans had to submit their policies and procedures related to SB 1004 in the beginning of November, um, and that relates to um, particularly um, patient identification and um, referral, some of which we'll be talking about uh, today. And the other thing that we now know um, that's been clarified is that January 1 is the implementation date. So um, SB 1004 is only a few uh, DHCS page with um, all of their materials and the link uh, to the all plan letter if you have not yet seen it. So I wanted to just go through because I know um, that some folks on the call probably had seen drafts of um, previous all plan letters uh, and or if you've been participating in our technical assistance series, we've been working um, with the drafts that we've been aware of um, for the all plan letter. So the key um, highlights here is that there were not any changes to the eligibility criteria, and that includes both the general eligibility criteria and the disease-specific criteria for heart failure, COPD, cancer, and end-stage liver disease. In terms of the required services, um, there were in some of the, in the initial drafts, there were eight required services, and in the final version, there are only seven required services. And the thing that was um, dropped as a requirement was the chaplain services piece. Um, as we discussed, um, for those who were part of the workshops for topic two, um, uh, it's our uh, recommendation and also the recommendation um, embedded in the requirements that chaplain services are um, included in the palliative care services that you provide. Medi-Cal mechanisms. 
In addition, um, the plan of care requirement, there was a little bit more clarification um, about what is not required to be in the plan of care, and that's um, reference to services that are pro being provided under other um, Medi-Cal uh, benefits or other plan programs. In terms of the requirements for plans, there were some additional uh, requirements that the managed care plans have to have a process to identify the beneficiaries that are eligible for palliative care, which includes a provider referral process, and the plans have to inform and educate providers about the availability of the palliative care benefit. So I think these things um, were um, definitely themes throughout the process of the draft um, that we had read, but they were um, very clearly stated in the final all plan letter. And again, um, clarification that these services need to be available for all um, Medi-Cal members who enrolled in the managed care plans as of January 1, 2018. Um, as we've gone through this technical assistance series, the way that we mapped things out, um, particularly with the um, July, expected July 2018 implementation date, um, we have uh, developed five topics that we think of as the core um, components of building community-based palliative care. We already looked um, at topics one and two, estimating member or patient need for palliative care, estimating the cost for delivering services, and then our initial plan was for topic three to focus on evaluating the current capacity for palliative care. And then uh, in the winter and spring, moving into the last two topics of developing a strategy to expand services, engaging and promoting sustainability and success. Based on the revised timeline for implement, implementing what we initially conceived of as topics three and four, um, so that we can really keep pace with what's happening and the realities for the plans and for the program and um, try to consolidate the content for uh, topics three and four and share those with you um, this month and then next month in the workshop. So what we're going to be talking about today is assessing capacity for palliative care and then launching services. Um, and then what we will be focusing on um, in the spring will be what used to be topic five, gauging and promoting sustainability and success. And then next summer after um, hopefully um, programs and plans have about six months of experience at uh, trying to implement SB 1004, we'd like to come together and um, facilitate a discussion about lessons learned and how to adjust programs so that they are successful and sustainable. And as Kate mentioned, these uh, slides and a recording are, of this webinar are going to be distributed uh, by the end of this week. So the objectives for today are to describe the conditions and supports that are required to optimize the delivery to assess the, need, the palliative care capacity of local providers and then to identify any gaps in readiness to deliver SB 1004 palliative care, to discuss the strategies to optimize referral of eligible members, and then to describe the lessons learned about patient referral from Medi-Cal plans that already have palliative care programs in place. And um, we will definitely try to make some time for questions um, or discussion at the end um, of this session. So if you have questions, um, feel free to type them in um, as we go along um, or at the end of the presentation. So first, let's talk about what are the key ingredients for, um, for palliative care when you're developing programs, particularly in the community. So I think of three main pillars of or components. Um, of what it takes to have successful palliative care programs, and particularly thinking about SB 1004 implementation. So we're gonna go into each of these in some more detail. So first, thinking about who are the right patients for referral. And this is um, building off of, or kind of working with some of the content that we discussed in topic two. Um, so if you have, criteria that are too broad um, for identifying or referring patients, um, then if you refer too many patients, then the palliative care team that you have um, could get overwhelmed 
and couldn't meet the demand. Um, there are there are limitations in how many palliative care specialists there are in the country and in California in particular. So you really want to be um, careful about sending sending patients that really need specialty level palliative care to palliative care specialists. And if you um, have an identification process that um, over identifies patients who could be eligible for SB 1004, and then um, that's the list that your partners are working with, that might waste their time evaluating patients who aren't actually eligible for SB 1004 services in the end. On the other hand, if your um, identification or referral criteria are too narrow, um, then you may uh, likely miss patients who could have actually benefited from the services or could have benefited from them for longer. Um, and, and if you don't have enough patients that you're referring to your palliative care partners, then it may be difficult for the palliative care program to be sustainable to have all of the services that they need, the interdisciplinary team, and um, in some cases, the 24-hour um, support for patients, um, it's hard to sustain those without economies of scale. So being in the middle between these two, um, looking for patients who ideally have a prognosis of around six to 12 months, who can really get the most benefit from these services, um, and ideally who have some level of pre-screening for eligibility or the, have a collaborative process of screening patients for eligibility. And we'll talk about that uh, strategy later on in this presentation. Next, you wanna think about what's the right time um, for patient referral. We know that palliative care can have greater impact um, when their contact with patients starts at least 90 days before death. Um, we uh, kind of refer to that sometimes as early palliative care, sadly, because in many cases, palliative care only gets involved in the last days or weeks of life. And when palliative care can get involved earlier on, more than 90 days before death, we know that there are implications for the quality of care that patients and family members receive around things like how often are they admitted to the hospital in the last month of life? How often are they admitted to the ICU in the last month of life? How long do they get the benefit of hospice services? Um, it can be tricky to uh, identify Medi-Cal patients earlier on, um, although many of them have uh, contact with the medical system um, more than 90 days before death, sometimes they present very late with serious illness or they come in inconsistently. Um, and that is due to um, largely competing priorities and access to care issues. So in that setting, you really want to think about um, patient identification and triage um, for this population in particular given the reality that um, some subset of patients are going to present with very late stage illness, particularly late stage cancers, you wanna think about strategies to identify and refer patients right from the time of diagnosis because some subset will be eligible for SB 1004 right from the time of diagnosis. For others who might have um, inconsistent contact with the healthcare system, setting up strategies to um, work with partners who can recognize disease progression earlier on, even if they're not having contact with um, the regular healthcare system. And you should think about where are the key points in the system where patients actually can be identified. So is that uh, related to contact with the emergency room? Is that contact with their case manager? Is that contact with their food delivery system, you know, there are a lot of different creative ways to try to identify patients um, as they are starting to decline. Lastly, you need some support for the palliative care team um, in order to be successful. So I think about structures that should be in place, particularly around all of the non-clinical tasks that people have to do. 
um, what support services are possible um, to, to take away some of the burden of um, the administrative work um, that will be part of caring for patients in, who have complex serious illness and psychosocial issues across settings. And then things like how, um, what are the supports for handling crises after hours or even during hours? Are there people who can respond to issues quickly? And this is, becomes an issue when um, palliative care programs are just starting and they don't have the capacity to have full-time staff dedicated to a pilot program or to a small program. And so they might have other responsibilities. For education and training, um, as I've mentioned, the reality is that there are not enough specialty palliative care providers, particularly across all disciplines. And so there's a need for both time and for investment in continuing education um, for palliative care providers. And that may also look like time from supervising providers who are training up um, people who don't have as much experience in palliative care. And then the people who are current um, or who are doing palliative care need continuing education to stay current. And lastly, connection to additional resources, things like um, community services, social services, behavioral health services, and services that are available from the health plan. All of these things contribute to a palliative care team being able to care for Medi-Cal patients who have complicated needs, both medical and social. I am stealing a wonderful uh, diagram developed um, and presented by Kathleen Kerr earlier on in this series when we were talking about estimating the number of patients who might be eligible for SB 1004. The largest circle that you see represents the population of patients who would benefit from palliative care whether that's symptom management, psychosocial, spiritual support, um, care coordination, whole spectrum of services. But only a subset of those patients, the green circle, represent people who have SB 1004 conditions, um, the four uh, primary diagnoses that you need to be SB 1004 eligible. The yellow circle represents people who are then eligible for SB 1004 based on their functional status and their stage of illness. The blue circle represents people who are um, eligible and referred and identified because clearly, you know, we don't all have crystal balls to identify everyone at all times. So only a subset of the people who are actually eligible are gonna be recognized and identified in time. And then the smallest circle in the middle is of the people who are actually able and willing to accept the services um, of SB 1004 once they've been identified and referred. So this, of course, um, there's a, represents a big gap um, between the large population of people who would benefit from palliative care services and the smaller population of people who are eligible for and able and willing to accept SB 1004 palliative care. And in that gap, there are other high-risk patients and there are patients with other insurance, um, including dual eligible patients. And I'll say as my, in my experience as someone who um, is alongside many of the people on this call trying to develop and expand community-based palliative care services, this is a very real um, phenomenon. So as, for example, I was meeting with our pulmonologist to talk to them about Um, they're struggling with taking care of and how to identify people in time. Um, in part of that discussion, they presented a patient who is a middle-aged person who has end-stage interstitial lung disease, who's on the maximum amount of oxygen therapy that uh, can be provided outside of an acute care setting. And this person also has complex psychosocial issues, um, is monolingual Spanish speaking, and has a lot of layers of um, complexity. The primary care provider and the pulmonology team are overwhelmed with how to care for this person. So 
they turned to me and said, can you see this patient as well? And, uh, and I think philosophically, and for a lot of reasons, um, it makes sense for us to see that patient, but that's a decision that we have to make kind of with eyes wide open about who we're going to include in terms of providing palliative care related to or outside of SB 1004. So in addressing the gap, um, in, in the situation with the patient that I talked about with interstitial lung disease, there are a couple of options. You can either um, expand your eligibility criteria and say, this person really is sick and needs, um, needs the support of palliative care, even though he doesn't meet the criteria for SB 1004. Um, and that, that might of course just do that infinitely you need to make thoughtful choices about who exactly you're expanding services for um, the other option is to keep the um, the population who receive the more intensive um, SB 1004 services just to the population that are stipulated in the eligibility criteria but you could um, do more work to invest in supporting the frontline providers who can deliver what we call primary palliative care. So they are doing frontline symptom management, discussion around prognosis, um, assessing patient values, doing advanced care planning, and so on. If you're going to do this, which I would argue is a really important strategy, and um, a number of the plans are already doing uh, this type of work in uh, their service areas, you need to do an evaluation similar to um, the key ingredients that I talked about before, thinking about, okay, there are lots of patients with serious illness. Who are the right patients for your frontline providers to focus on? When should they engage with these patients? And what else, what other supports do they need within the constraints of the way that they deliver service in your system? So takeaways from uh, this section on uh, key ingredients for palliative care. This, the SB 1004 benefit is, I think, fantastic and really um, forward thinking. But in order to be successful, you need several other supports. Um, and that's the right patient at the right time and then the additional support um, for the palliative care program. You need to think uh, proactively about how you're going to address the gap of patients or members who need palliative care and who, who is actually going to get palliative care services. And you can either expand your eligibility criteria or, um, and or um, support frontline providers in delivering frontline palliative care. So what I want to focus on now is are you or your partners ready to deliver palliative care? And maybe when I ask that question, um, people uh, feel some anxiety because we're only a few weeks away from implementation of SB 1004. And I think part of, a big part of what we're trying to do in this technical assistance series is to help um, decrease people's anxiety level around um, preparation and implementation of SB 1004. But what I'm really going to focus on today is more the steps um, in assessing readiness to deliver palliative care. So as you're in these conversations, as I know many um, plans and uh, palliative care providers on this call are um, in conversation with, with partners, you want to think about um, how ready um, are you or is your partner to deliver palliative care? And um, so I have a checklist here kind of thinking about these key domains of um, awareness and experience core competencies, and then organizational readiness. The thing that I want to emphasize about this, this list is that um, I would imagine that there are very few programs who could check every box on this list. Some are going to be stronger in some areas and weaker in others, or not have um, really a lot in, in some category here. Um, but the key is 
to, to know what to look for and to identify areas of potential gaps before you get started. So we're gonna go through each of these in a little bit more detail. So first, awareness and experience. Um, so for a palliative care um, provider, someone who you're going to be working with as your palliative care provider, um, what is their experience with the context of serious illness? Um, how that impacts patients, not just physically, but emotionally and socially, relationally? Um, what is the impact on their families and their caregivers? And what is the range of needs of patients and families and caregivers when they're dealing with serious illness? Um, and some people that you may approach may have um, a whole lot of experience in a subset of the palliative care population, but not the entirety. Um, and, or they may have um, experience in providing um, frontline palliative care, but they may um, not have done uh, dedicated work with the Medi-Cal population. So these are things to think about. Um, in terms of awareness of resources, does your partner um, know about people in the community, organizations in the community who they could work with to help address the needs, particularly of the Medi-Cal population? and faith-based organizations, particularly um, if you're thinking about how do we deliver um, chaplaincy services or spiritual care, um, working with um, partners and faith-based organizations may be really um, important. And then thinking about other clinical partners, um, though there's uh, obviously, as many on this call know, um, efforts to try to integrate um, medical services and behavioral health services, there still are silos. Um, and so how, how do we work um, across those silos to connect patients who have significant um, mental health um, or substance use issues to behavioral health services that they need when they have a little bit more time and they're in the last year of life, not just in the last few weeks of life? And then thinking about the palliative care or the Medi-Cal population, um, you may really want to work with experts um, from homeless health services um, because that, there are a lot of challenges that are um, unfamiliar to folks who have not been working uh, a lot with that population. Uh, the core competencies that you want to be looking for in your palliative care partners uh, really track a lot with the required services for SB 1004, so I won't go into a ton of detail here other than to say you, the core competencies of assessing and managing a um, bunch of symptoms, psychosocial needs, and spiritual needs. You really need um, expertise around prognostication, not just a, a general sense of how someone is doing, but really an awareness of the literature and the tools that we have to think about um, prognosis. Um, expertise in communication and assessing uh, patient values, doing advanced care planning with a population who may not have done a lot of planning in advance um, or who may have um, concerns about uh, legal forms and those practicalities, um, how to do that, and then evaluating hospice eligibility and referring as they need to. we're going to also talk about organizational readiness. So this is something that's really, um, again, gets at these kind of conditions that you need um, in order to deliver palliative care outside of the direct patient care. So first, I think about structures and relationships. So is there flexibility in the care delivery? You, are you, if you're in a clinic-based setting, are you able to change up the amount of time that you have for appointments? Typically, palliative care specialists get 60 minutes for a new patient appointment, which would be a primary care provider's dream to have that. So if you're going to work, um, work with uh, providers, making sure they have um, actually enough time or flexibility to change things as needed. Um, as I mentioned before, how do you address patient needs after hours? Um, if patients uh, are just directed to voicemail, they're usually their option is to call 911. So what are the ways that you're going to try to avoid um, unnecessary visits to the ED or the hospital. And then how connected is the organization to primary care, specialty care, and 
um, organizations like complex care management teams or special populations. Uh, the team composition, is there an interdisciplinary team? What do the team members do? Do they have other responsibilities? And are they going to be able to take the time that they need to work with um, the SB1004 patients who are referred? And to what extent are the patients of the team members working together or are they working really in parallel and communication might be an issue? Are there standard procedures or workflows around time, specific time points when clinical assessments are done um, at particular events or um, processes of care? Um, what tools are used? Is it just a general um, provider-specific assessment or are there standardized tools that are used? And is the patient identification strategy, is it more proactive or is it reactive? Waiting for referrals to come to you or going out and seeking out those referrals from your partners? Is there time for non-clinical activity? Um, mentioned, you know, continuing education is critical um, for these teams. Do they have the time for assessing quality and actually improving on things if they recognize any opportunities for improvement? Um, do they have the um, ability to collect and report data and are they doing work to continue to find what are the supports that are available in the community and how can they expand their networks? Lastly, and something that usually kind of comes to mind quickly is what is their ability? How many patients can they see? Can they take on more patients with the existing um, staff and structure that they have? Um, or could they possibly take on more in the near term? Um, if you, there are important things to think about when you're working particularly with providers who work in the safety net, that there are a bunch of other things that influence their ability to grow or to maintain growth, like what's happening with state or federal legislation around the Affordable Care Act, or what is the budget cycle for county health systems. Um, teams may not be able to flex up as quickly as they might want to. So this is, you know, and just a, really a conceptual um, I, idea for as you're having these conversations with your palliative care partners, um, looking for all of the things that are going to go into having successful partnerships. And as I said at the outset of this, um, most people are going to have some gap. Um, and the only question is, um, how, do you, how do you address those gaps once you find them? So that's what we're going to talk about now. So the first step in addressing gaps, of course, to review and share any concerns about the gaps that um, you have with your um, payer or provider partner to discuss opportunities and strategies to fill the, that, those gaps, and then to evaluate um, the likelihood that the gap is going to be able to be filled in a timely manner. There are a couple of different approaches, particularly when you're thinking about expanding clinical capacity. Um, you can focus on internal strategies of hiring brand new staff, or if you have people who have, are already in your organization who are doing other things but don't have as much experience with delivering palliative care, you can allocate the time and the uh, resources to help train them. Or you can work uh, with external partners and outsource um, these gap areas to external partners. The caution I would say in that is um, that it seems pretty clear in um, the all plan letter that the palliative care services that are authorized under SB 1004 do need to be provided by the palliative care team. So I think um, though there are some pieces that you could um, work with partners to deliver that are support, all of the core services do need to be provided by the palliative care team. So once you have identified the gap, 
and you're discussing them um, and the possibilities that um, your partner um, will be able to address the gaps, um, you can either have kind of come together with um, your partner is going to be able to fill in the gaps independently. Um, probably more commonly, there's collaboration to fill in those gaps. Um, or um, there might be situations where you determine that the partner is just going, not going to be able to fill in the gaps. Um, in enough time to be an effective partner for SB 1004. And it's better to um, come to that realization earlier on after you've kind of thoughtfully go, gone through these, um, all of these domains rather than finding that out three months from now or six months from now. So with the um, last um, 10 or so minutes here, I want to talk about moving from planning to implementation. And this is, you know, a behavior change model that most of the clinicians on the call will likely recognize that moving us from just thinking and planning really into um, action and uh, getting ready to go. So again, there are a lot of steps uh, to go from uh, just planning to actual implementation. We've already discussed in previous topics, estimating the need for services, estimating the cost. Um, we're talking about uh, identifying partners, and I know that many on the call are well on their way to um, having their partners and are actually into developing and finalizing contracts and agreements. Um, and then uh, policies and procedures, in many cases, have been submitted or close to being submitted. And then now we're really getting into the work of developing workflows and how is this actually going to work with identifying and referring patients, reviewing and authorizing or denying services, and then collecting, reporting, and reviewing your data. What I'm gonna focus on mostly uh, for the rest of this time is uh, on patient identification and referral. So, uh, I know, again, that there can be a lot of um, anxiety when you think about January 1 is coming and uh, a gun is going to go off and we need to be um, ready to go um, on January 1. But I would really argue that this is, you should think about this more um, like a marathon rather than a sprint. And in a marathon, you know, you have a really, a large group of people um, who get started in a whole, um, different uh, different pieces. Um, so some people are going to be right out at front because they have already been um, delivering services to Medi-Cal patients. And for others, it's, uh, um, it's pretty new. And so I think you need to think about pacing yourself um, for, for benefits that are going to be going on um, for years to come and not just um, uh, the potential anxiety around um, having everything um, uh, perfect um, and ready to sprint on January 1. So again, we're going to talk about some key ingredients about patient identification and referral and go through each of these uh, in a little bit of detail. So first, you need to attend to unique patient population. So we've talked about how um, Medi-Cal patients will likely more often present late in their illness course. Some um, are not going to be able to engage with providers in the typical ways of coming to clinic appointments. So need to um, be aware of that. Um, many will have a mistrust of the medical system or unfamiliarity with it. And there may be cultural or language barriers to delivering services. Um, to identify patients at the time of diagnosis, which is you wouldn't typically think you need to do that with the, the eligibility criteria being um, really uh, identifying patients with very advanced illness, but some subset of Medi-Cal patients are only going to present with very advanced illness. You need to have mechanisms to identify them from the time of diagnosis. And then uh, it's really gonna be helpful to partner with trusted providers or organizations who can el who identify eligible members for not just from the medical um, world, but also social service and community providers. And the typical um, referral process is really a reactive one. Um, but 
since more uh, Medi-Cal patients are going to present late, it can be really challenging to identify these patients in time for them to really benefit from palliative care services. Um, and the reality is that there are referring providers out there that might have lingering misconceptions about when palliative care is appropriate. And they may think that it's too early to refer people, say, while they're still pursuing disease-modifying therapy. Um, so, so if you wait for providers to refer, um, you're really going to miss a lot of patients. You're going to get them too late. Um, so you need to really shift to a more proactive um, approach to patient identification. We're going to talk about what that looks like, both from the payer side and from the provider side, and then what does a combination look like. This is something that we've talked about to some degree in um, earlier topics that wanted to review here since um, everyone is, uh, I know, in the process of thinking about the mechanism of identifying and referring patients. So from the payer side, um, you can use claims data to look for potentially eligible patients. Um, and we've, we've talked about this in previous topics about looking at um, subsets of diagnoses codes, um, requests for durable medical equipment, um, utilization patterns, and then costs. And it's going to be important, um, given the nature of the Medi-Cal population, to set routine intervals for identifying patients. Um, and then having a workflow of pushing that information to providers. For providers, um, it's going to be important to develop clinical triggers to identify patients. They mentioned some will be um, presenting very late, and so identifying them um, with a new diagnosis or the new diagnosis of disease progression. Um, they had been diagnosed at stage two cancer, and now they're stage four and they're eligible. Or an event um, like a hospitalization or a fall or other things that kind of might, might make a, a trigger um, for keying in on a high-risk patient. Um, it's helpful to um, proactively perform routine um, reviews of patient panels. So having providers look through their lists and think about who are they worried about, who is declining, who has the SB1004 um, disease type that um, are going to be eligible, who you can then um, review more closely. And there are um, some good practices out there in terms of having um, your palliative care team actually um, participate in these care conferences to help review patients for eligibility. These proactive um, strategies can come together um, because the payer side um, strategies are likely to over-identify patients, whereas the provider strategies are more likely to under-identify patients. So if you bring those two together, it does um, obviously require um, the mo more effort, but it's best for identifying the right patients at the right time. And there are a couple examples of um, plans who are out there who already are providing um, services to the SB1004 population who have um, uh, processes in place for patient identification. So for example, um, Partnership Health Plan um, started piloting services um, a couple of years ago, and their initial strategy for identifying um, members who might be eligible for palliative care services turned out that it um, over-identified patients. Um, and so they transitioned to a different approach, which was um, first kind of encouraging their partners to develop relationships with the referring practices to help them identify patients more proactively, and also um, having uh, discussions routinely with primary and specialty provider groups working from a list of patients to um, call that list down to really find um, the people who are eligible rather than um, putting um, putting the bulk of that work um, on their palliative care partners. For the health plan of San Joaquin, they've um, taken an approach um, that really initially focused on the inpatient uh, side, identifying patients at their time of crisis when they're in the hospital. And they worked with their palliative care um, inpatient team to help find patients who might be eligible for referral. And there's been a lot of efforts kind of um, thinking about education 
of their uh, first of their palliative care providers of these services are available beyond um, the clinic, but also of their other primary care and their specialty care um, providers. And that is going to be expanding in the coming months as SB 1004 is rolling out to increasingly larger numbers of um, frontline providers in the community. So the lessons learned about patient um, identification and referral, that it's really critical to work um, with providers who have ready access to clinical information, particularly because the eligibility criteria rely on clinical information. Um, it's uh, really an iterative process um, that's most helpful in improving the information flow between the patient and provider. What's working? What isn't working? How can we make this um, more efficient um, and more effective? Um, it's important for the palliative care team to be aware of the other resources that are available to patients who don't meet the criteria so that when they're having conversations with referring providers and patients don't meet the criteria, they can offer something else. And lastly, it's important to recognize um, the cost to the palliative care group of determining if a member is eligible and will and can accept services. So in summary, um, in, in order to have um, sustainable programs and partnerships, there are several key conditions that need to exist. The right patients, the right time, and the right support. Um, it's, we need to identify the gaps in providers' availability, ability to sustainably deliver palliative care services and discuss strategies to bridge those gaps, both in the short and the long term. And then in order to provide the most benefit for patients and have financial sustainability, it's going to be critical to develop proactive patient identification strategies between trusted providers and the managed care plan. So we are going to be delving into all of these topics in uh, much greater depth uh, in January. So we're going to have two workshop um, uh, opportunities in Northern California and two in Southern California. Um, so look for uh, emails to sign up for those workshops um, to find out more and kind of work through um, some of these some of these things uh, for your program or for your plan. Uh, I want to just uh, have a reminder here, as Kate mentioned at the beginning of the call, there are topic one and two materials that are available on the website listed there. And then um, the email address and website for SB 1004. And if you have any questions um, around the technical assistance series, please email Glenda. And with that, I'd like to um, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, Anne. Uh, this is Kate Myers again from CHCF. I'm just taking a quick look at the question box. Uh, let's see. Uh, one person asked, please explain what you mean about the cost to PC groups in identifying patients in slide number 40, if you wanted to back up. Yeah. What um, so, get my window here. Um, so for when you are a um, a program that is um, is oriented towards particularly um, uh, delivering services in the home, um, you can imagine uh, if you are going out to try to find if you're not um, affiliated with a clinical service or a hospital system and you don't have the clinical information, you just get a patient's name, says we think this person might be eligible. You then need to go to um, the providers who have that information and find out um, what, whether they meet the eligibility criteria. And then if you pass that hurdle, then you need to go further and talk to the patient about whether the patient um, wants to accept the services and is able to accept the services. And all of that takes a lot of effort and time. And that, um, that costs, costs your program money. Thank you, Anne. Another question that came in is, are there palliative care specific service codes? Um, so that is a great uh, question. And I think that, uh, there are there are codes um, around um, palliative care services for sure. 
but um, I think that the general uh, feeling with those codes is that um, it's uh, it can be dangerous to rely on those in terms of identifying patients just because um, coders might use them for other things that are not um, specialty level palliative care. Um, so if, um, if the question was around um, using those codes for um, identifying patients, um, I think that's, that's uh, those are my thoughts on that. If you're talking about using the codes for um, for delivering palliative care services, then um, please type in a follow-up and we can talk about that. Thank you. Okay, a few more questions have come in. One is, uh, to help us assess operational readiness, could you recommend a few evidence-based clinical assessment tools? Um, so, to, um, so what are what are tools that people might use is what I um, what I'm hearing from this for when you're thinking about their operational readiness. So there are things like um, standard tools like the um, Edmonton Symptom Assessment Scale um, that looks at many domains of uh, physical symptoms and uh, emotional symptoms. Um, that are used kind of by many um, specialty palliative care programs, um, or there are things like um, specific uh, screening tools around uh, psychosocial distress um, uh, or spiritual assessments. So there are there are a number of different tools that are available in different domains, and I think uh, the the key question is around. Is, um, is the program using um, any tools or are they um, doing informal assessments? What does that look like? Okay, thank you. There was a follow-up comment from the questioner who was asking about the codes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not sure if this will um, illuminate it more, but it says, um, yes, it's for approving palliative care, not to identify patients. So I'm not entirely sure if that for approving palliative care. So, um, hmm, um, you know, I would suggest that maybe the um, person who is submitting this question to um, to contact us, to contact Glenda with the question and um, can maybe have a conversation offline because I'm not, I don't think I'm getting um, uh, uh, authorizing palliative care services. I don't think you would use um, use a code um, for authorizing. I can imagine how you would use um, codes when you're delivering palliative care services or when you are um, trying to look for who might be eligible. Um, but I have, I'm, I'm missing something, I think, in the middle. So um, sorry about that. And, um, and please reach out by email. Thanks, Anne. And another, another attendee, I think, is contributing to your answer there by saying the state is not providing CPT codes for palliative care authorization requests if that was yes, um, helpful in that response, yeah. Um, okay, another participant has asked, can you speak more about the need for board certified palliative care physician versus use of a strong attentive PCP to be the lead physician? Under what circumstances do you feel a board certified PC specialist is needed? Boy, that is a great question. <laughs> um, a big question. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, big question. One that we could definitely um, uh, spend hours talking about. Um, but I think, you know, I uh, um, obviously I, I have a bias. I'm, I am a palliative care physician. Um, I think that one of the keys here is that um, the eligibility criteria really point to patients who are really um, only months away um, from the end of life. And um, and it is uh, there. I work with incredible um, generalists and um, frontline providers um, who I think do tremendous work. Um, I think the thing is, um, does the person actually have um, the expertise um, in the complex um, symptom management that comes up um, for this patient population? 
Um, does this person actually have the dedicated time to do it? Do they have um, all of the kind of other supports that are needed? Like, you know, a primary care provider often has 15 minutes with a patient. Are they going to be able to do um, what's needed in caring for this patient population? Um, so I think, you know, the state has been clear in saying um, that people have to have special um, kind of training experience um, or certification in palliative care to be um, the palliative care partner um, for SB 1004. But I would really um, kind of encourage whenever possible to have really a, a designated um, team that does have kind of special experience in this and um, whenever possible working with people who are actually specialists. Thank you, Anne. We are just um, a minute or two away from needing to close here. So I would say if there are other questions that are time sensitive that folks would like to send our way, please do send those um, to Glenda Paha. There was um, one other question that I just wanted to quickly answer. First, it was a comment that this is a great presentation. I totally agree. Thank you, Anne. Um, but there was a question about whether people would be receiving um, the kind of Q&As from this last 10 minutes. And, and we aren't typically writing those up. So, but we do have the webinar recording available, so you're welcome to go back and listen to that last segment if there was something you wanted to review. And I would say for those who have questions and would love to dive deeper into these um, nuances and details, please consider um, signing up and putting together a team, um, a small team from your organization to one of our in-person workshops and you'd get to spend time with Anne and with Kathleen Kerr and with your other colleagues uh, in the region thinking about these really important and thorny issues. Of course, we can't address everything in an hour, but we hope this was a great introduction and um, hope to see a lot of you at our in-person workshops. Um, one other reminder I got from our colleagues at the CSU Institute for Palliative Care Services at the state to educate Medi-Cal providers in support of SB 1004. Um, we have emailed that information out to all of you in the past, um, so hopefully you have it, um, but we will include the link for accessing information about CSU's courses and how to apply for um, this covered uh, course enrollment uh, with our uh, follow-up email with the slides and recording from today's webinar. So the CSU Institute for Palliative Care is still accepting applications for their educational courses, so we encourage you to consider that as well. With that, we are at the top of the hour, and I just want to thank Anne uh, and Kathleen Kerr so much for their work that went into this, and Anne for presenting today, and uh, look forward to seeing many of you at our workshops. Thanks again.